the Cybersecurity and Compliance Podcast with Craig Petronella. Learn about the most current IT security threats in ransomware, phishing, business email compromise, cyber crime tactics, cyber heist schemes, social engineering scams, as well as hints and tips from leading professionals to help you prevent hackers from penetrating your network and dropping ransomware or malware payloads. This podcast will arm you with the best info to defend your network against the latest cyber crimes. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And now, here's your host, Craig Petronella. You're listening to Cybersecurity and Compliance with Craig Petronella. Visit us online at petronellatech.com. Oh, welcome, Matt. Nice hey. to have you here today. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So introduce yourself to my audience, if you, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, Matt, Matt Holcomb. I uh, work with Biltmore Insurance Services here in the greater Atlanta area. Uh, focusing in the IT, security, cyber, data breach, um, those fields. So I've been working in the insurance industry for over 20 years, so I have quite a bit of experience. Uh, but like with anything, you always want to try and learn. And with cyber, it's forever changing. It's, <laughs> it's right. something new. That's right. Well, <laughs> well, great to have you. I appreciate it very much. So obviously, yeah. a lot of the folks on that listen to the podcast and that are in my tribe, they all need cybersecurity insurance. Um, any tips for them when they're shopping around? What should they look for? I know that I've uh, I've heard that some coverage does not include what's called cybercrime. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it's like with with it's with the, with the property and casualty side. You, it's not like health insurance where you buy a policy and has everything wrapped into it. When you come to the side of property and casualty, even you know it's everything is kind of. Um, a la carte. So you may have cyber insurance, but there could be things that, you know, crime may not be covered, um, money wiring, any of this stuff may not be covered. It's a secondary that you have to ask for. So <clears throat> some carriers will include stuff like that. Some carriers will even put like a cyber policy on a traditional general liability um, <clears throat> and wrap it into that, that coverage amount. But if you're, if you're serious, a lot of times you want to break out, have your own <clears throat> standalone cyber policy. Um, Hartford's a really strong care that we use. Uh, and basically, you know, just it depends on what 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 you're being asked as well. Because a lot of times when people will come to us, you know, they have a contract with, the, with let's say, Coca-Cola. We'll give them as an example. And like we have this contract with Coke. Before we can do anything, we have to have X, Y, Z. And we'll take a look at their current policies and say, OK, I see you have cyber. You don't have third party crime. You don't have, you know, data breach or some things that are missing out of this policy. So we're going to have to get those. Um, and then from there, we go and shop the market and see who's the, you know, there's a handful of carriers. Like I said, Hartford's been around. They've been doing, they actually were one of the first, um, they insured Uber before it became a ride sharing nice. company. Um, so just, we go out and take a look and see what's going to be a good fit for them. You know, and a lot of times you try to explain to them price, don't look at price alone. Make sure you're looking at the coverages because the last thing you want to do is to find out what coverage you have when it comes time to claim, so. Okay, good information. So um, it sounds like there's almost like a menu of services, a portfolio of services that you offer um, that seems to be ever changing. Is there somewhere that um, folks can go to kind of stay up to date or, or know what questions to ask you when kind of shopping around? Um, well, there would be us that typically were asked, would ask the questions and we would we would dig into it. But I mean, even, they can talk to their agent. Um, they can definitely what will happen is whenever they come to a carrier, uh, they'll have an application they have to complete pretty much always. Uh, they'll also the carrier is going to look do a deep dive into that company. They're going to look at their website and they're going to see everything they do. And then from there, they're going to say, OK, we can cover X, Y, Z or we can cover this. but We can only cover it for this limit. So you okay. may have to go outside to get that. And. We, we, we try to tell our, our, our the companies, or the, 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 a, uh, the clients we work with, we try to explain to them, if there's something on your website that you don't do anymore, take it off. Because okay. um, you'd be surprised. A lot of times, you know, if someone would kind of just do an IT, you know, wet, let's say cloud-based stuff, but they may have done something in the past that they kind of dabble with on the side a little bit. And then all of a sudden the carrier looks at it and says, we can't cover that. We're not going to be able to cover you at all. So Interesting. So what would yes. be like a basic example of that, like an activity that maybe somebody's doing that might disqualify them? 
It's it's pretty tough in the IT industry. Um, you would have to be doing something that could could something that could hurt the company as far as I don't know if you're doing something. You know, if you were you were working with you were like let's like I say you were a company that used to do like I say you had something with were like a ride share. That's an example. You were a rideshare company. Then you all of a sudden you've morphed into an Uber. So that'd be a reversed way that Uber did it because Uber obviously started off as an app and then went into the rideshare and they immediately got excluded from Hartford. So they had to go elsewhere. So in that situation, that'd be a good example. So it's like a significant have- business model change. Is that yes. pretty accurate then? So it's kind of like maybe going from IT and then um, doing ride sharing or, or something so different yes. like that. Y- yes. Yes. Or in the situation, like I said, if you, did do ride sharing in the past. Let's say you're a taxi company right. and you liked what Uber was doing. So you decided to create, um, you know, you wanted to do just the app for it, the, just that. Not, right. And we're not doing any more taxi services. We're just doing straight up the app for all the other taxi companies that are out there. But you leave on your website and we also service, you know, we also are a taxi service. Just somewhere and someone forgot to take it off or something, that immediately will trigger. The carriers will say, no, we won't take this because you're not just an app company you're actually doing ride share as well or you're a taxi so we're not that's a completely different animal and we don't want it got it okay so it's almost like the first engagement is they speak to a professional like you you go through maybe a series of questions or interview with them questionnaire kind of drill yes. down into their daily business activities and maybe score their risks to figure yes. out what might be the best products or services in your portfolio to offer them is that Really yes, that's a that's a very accurate and to dive a little deeper on that. Um, one thing is we also have companies that will come to us a lot of times and say, hey, we've got this contract with this company and they're requiring, you know, X dollars of coverage on these certain limits. I mean, on certain lines, excuse me. And we'll ask them the first thing we ask is what size company are you? Oh, you know, we're a two million dollar company. We have to explain, okay, you're asking you're, you're asking us to go out to market for a five million underlying GL and a five million crime and cyber. Um, nobody's gonna touch that because you don't even have enough money. You're not even worth that. So oh, so actually- that's interesting. So you're saying that so if the company, uh, let's say my company is a two million dollar company, for example, mm-hmm. and I want five or ten million dollars in coverage, you're saying mm-hmm. that that's pretty much not possible because the revenues aren't there. Is that true? Correct. Yeah. Got it. I had a company here in Atlanta that did that. They actually are with it. They, they are embedded in Coke and they actually do software for Coca-Cola. So they had to have all these limits and all these different coverages. And one of them was just a basic general liability policy and an umbrella. They wanted a 10 million general liability policy. Wow. And then a 10 million umbrella on top of that. So they wanted 20 million in coverage. Oh my goodness. Yeah. They were a $5 million company. So we could, we, we couldn't go anywhere, but Coke was, was willing to work with them because they wanted to work and allow them to come in with whatever they could. Reduced. Okay. Yeah. And as the company grew to a $50 million company, we were able to increase that to get it to the limits they that Coke would be satisfied. That's that's very interesting. That's good information. Yeah. So um, it sounds like the, the coverage that you're able to get is based on a, a, a one criteria would be your mm-hmm. revenue. So yeah. if your business is 1 million, then you're probably only going to get 1 million in coverage. If you're 10 million, maybe you'll get 10 million in coverage with some more detailed interview process um, to see if you, so uh, you also mentioned umbrella policy. So maybe they can, if we'll just use a small business of 1 million as an example, maybe they could qualify for 1 million in cyber. Could they also get a million in umbrella for the total of 2 million in coverage? Is that um, it depends. Cyber, certain policies, cyber does not sit over. So you may have it sit over some of the cyber, but there are things like a good example is professional liability, which goes hand in hand a lot of times with cyber, because that is something that covers you for any advice you give, any information. Like if you recommend something to someone, it doesn't turn out the way they wanted it. They could sue you for you gave us the wrong information. It was your professional. Um, it was your professional wisdom, whatever, you know, it's your professional, you know, you're the ones that advise this professional advice that said we need to do this. It didn't work. So we're suing you. So umbrella can, will not ever sit on that because that's based off your actual, you know, what you've done. Whereas general liability is 
just basically someone tripping and falling. So some cybers can have us have an umbrella sit on it, but sometimes you have, you have to check with the carriers a lot of times and to see what what they will allow to sit on top of of the underlying policies. Okay, so you've got your general coverage, then you've got mm-hmm. an umbrella that's separate, and mm-hmm. then potentially you have a cyber security coverage separate agreement for that, and then you might also want cyber crime coverage. Yes. Um, so how do how do people figure out? How much is enough? Like, I like the way that you said, well, if your revenue is X, then that's pretty much all you're going to get. Is the, That sounds fairly accurate. But how do you know, like, how much is enough for the other pieces? Like, so, for example, we use the $1 million example of a small business. They get a, a million dollars in general coverage. Maybe they get a million in an umbrella. They want to get cyber insurance and they also want cyber crime coverage. How much is enough or, or how do you drill down onto that? Uh, that's a good question, and I've been asked that million, millions of times, <laughs> and it's funny. I listened to actually um, years ago, one of the uh, carriers was having a seminar, and they sat and we talked about that, and they said there is no magic number. There is no number that says this is going to this is going to fit you and this is going to take care of you. It's for whatever people want to sue for, and that's the scary thing. Right. But they can only get so much, so if your company is a $2 million company and you have a million with a million umbrella – Typically, they'll stop there. Most people are like, yeah, two million, I'm satisfied. I'll walk away. Okay. Um, but you may have it where some situation where people want to keep going further and further and further. And it's just whatever the judgment is and, and just depends on, you know, what they want. So it's there is no magic number on on those limits. The only one that, believe it or not, the only one that does have an, a number is worker, workers comp. Because at some point, the state runs out, everything runs out, and there's no more money. They're not paying anymore. So that's the one thing that you can actually say a million dollar policy will cover me fine because I know this person's going to a million dollars to be thrown at it for the, you know, we're fine. Yeah. You know, there's a maximum there. Right. Got it. Okay. Um, now another question that comes to mind is, is it possible to have more than one kind of like life insurance? You could buy life insurance more than one policy from different carriers. Like I could buy, a couple million dollars from you and then maybe get another policy somewhere else. Can you do that with cyber? You can do excess is what they call it. So it sits above the umbrella. Like I've had to do that as well, where they had Hartford would allow um, 3 million in underlying. And then we had to go to get up to the 10 million. We had to go to Chubb and say, they would say, okay, we'll take over the next 7 million. Um, Cause they, and, and once you get into that, like that level, it kind of changes the price changes a little bit because that first underlying three million Hartford knows they're going to be on the hook immediately if some if there's a claim. Chubb may never see. They may be able to sit back and say, okay, we're not going to we're not going to probably come into the into the, the the mix until they've exhausted that three million. And and similar with an umbrella, umbrellas are usually pretty inexpensive. Like you can get a like a, a one million underlying policy cost you two let's say two thousand a year, and then a million umbrella could be five hundred because they know that. That second million may never get touched. It's gonna be that first million that gets hit first. So that's the one that has to pay out. And that's the one that's typically gonna cost you more. Okay, but using the 1 million example that we're using earlier, so if we're a small business and we only make a million in revenue, yeah, could you get more, could you get 2 million in coverage from two separate carriers like that? Yeah, you would, in that situation, you would just wanna do a, a 1 million underline and then do a, two, a 1 million umbrella. Right. Um, there's no real reason to go to general liability policies because that's a different scenario altogether. And that's what you're talking about. So you basically just go ahead and either see if the carrier will increase it to the 2 million need, or just see if the umbrella will sit on top of it. Cause it'd be more cost prohibitive yeah. to do that. And if you do the other way, it's going to be just, the cost is going to be just, it's, it's, you'll pay more than you need to basically. Got it. Okay. All right. That sounds good. Now, what about, um, requirements for coverage are the, are you seeing new requirements around businesses needing policies procedures supporting evidence of certain security control layers audits um, security risk assessments penetration testing etc all that comes into play and that's one of the things the application will ask and that application is always evolving it's changing constantly um, you know you, one year you may have it where it asks questions of what what is your Day to day look like how did which is your security system your CISO all this different stuff what are we talking about what limits and what levels do you have and then the next year it may come in with another question of okay now we've had we've been hit in this arena do you have anything do you you know is there anything that you ever give out money like you know as far as you know 
uh, firmware or, or any kind of ransomware, any of this stuff that comes into play, more of ransomware, but any of this stuff that comes into play, now all of a sudden they're bringing in new questions. So yeah, it's because, because hackers and the people that are out, the bad people we'll call them are out there, it's always evolving, always changing. So in certain situations each year, you have to give more information to the company. You know, has this been updated? What's this look like? Um, they do want to see your financials all, you know, basically at Renault as well. So you'll see that a lot where they ask how big is the company? Cause it's your premiums based off of that as well. Like I said before, you, you said it, your revenues, your criteria, what, what are you doing? You know, what are you securing? What are you, what's your app look like? You know, what's, what's all the different things that come to you using a cloud-based system, all these different things come into play. Got it. So you've got almost, or the insurance industry has pretty much like a, um, and it's their own kind of scoring methodology around uh, some type of assessment risk level process to through a questionnaire or interview process to figure out how risky the client is and then how much coverage we, you know, they could potentially offer. Yeah. yeah. And in most situations, if it's a newer company, it's pretty straightforward. Um, they look at it and say, okay, it's a newer company. It's just, you know, here's the straight up uh, the, the policy here's what you're going to get if you want to add stuff on to it they'll, they'll bring in the mix they'll ask you if you want certain things to be added to the policy do you want crime like i said do you you know do you want um, third party uh crime to be added to it there's just different things that can come into the mix do you do any kind of wire transfers do we need to put that in there do we need to put credit card fraud do we need any kind of you know employment theft or or that's a good that falls under the crime but just different things may come into the mix that they'll ask at time of sale to kind of upsell it. So a lot of times with a brand new company, there's no exposure, there's no nothing. A lot of times you try and keep it as, as cost effective as possible, just because you don't want to kill them with, okay, you know, your, your policy could be a thousand dollars, but we're going to make it 10,000 for the year. So it's <laughs> like, yeah, I'm not even barely making that or, you know, I'm making a million dollars. You know, that's what their company's revenue is looking like. You know, why would I want to go so much to have all this, but, as the companies grow, we do reevaluations every year and we take a look and see what what's changed. You know, we ask him from questions about, um, you know, if you got any new systems, do you have any new, you know, any new hires? Do you have anybody that's, that's handling this like your, your, your playbook, I guess you could say, you know, what kind of security do you have? Do you, have you upgraded any of that? Because it's ever changing. Got it. Do you think that it'll be similar to auto insurance where there's kind of rewards maybe for good behavior, you know, maybe future discounts or if you could show supporting evidence of, you know, uh, pen testing, for example, or risk assessments policy, you know, you have more stuff, right? Um, And you can show the evidence of that stuff. Do you think that that might reduce premiums in the future because they might be a lower target? Um, Yeah, that could help. I mean, you you can always use that stuff to go and ask for credits. Sure. Um, We've done that a lot. We've shown that, hey, this these guys have been really strong. They haven't had any claims. You know, they got this now. They got, you know, let's go ahead and get some credits on this and see if we can kind of reduce their renewals. So you you typically don't want to go in with all the taking all the credits for the first year because there's nothing left for the second year. So right. you kind of want to sit back and just take us, you know, to get some credits in the first on the front end. But then also at renewal, if you have kind of an increase go ahead and start seeing, hey, listen, there's no, and there's been no claims. Why aren't we getting hit 10, 15, 20%? Are there any credits available? Um, or if it's just a point where you just want to shop it, you know, I don't recommend shopping a lot. You know, if some people want to shop every year, that doesn't really look good because then the carriers look and see you as a shifty person. Like you just shift anytime the winds change. So it's, it's not something that I would recommend. And you try to talk to the clients about it. And sometimes you lose them because they, you know, they just want to find something cheaper. And then that's, in this industry, that's not really the kind of person you want because they're not going to be satisfied at claim time because if they're going cheap, they're getting cheap. Sure. Well, it's like anything else. I mean, you know, you get what you pay for, right? Right. Um, You know, oftentimes we might get calls from somebody that gets hacked. And, you know, one of the first questions is we ask you, do you have cybersecurity insurance? Do you have cybercrime coverage? And sometimes they, they do, but it's not high enough. So it might only be $50,000 or something like that. Um, or maybe they don't have coverage. So, you know, so then it's a, it's a scramble of how do we help them? Because, you know, all this stuff, a lot of the pricing is out of our control, you know, it, right. Um, but yeah, no, I get what you're saying. And a lot of good information there. Um, 
the new, I don't know if you've heard of the new cybersecurity maturity model certification or the CMMC that was released from the DOD, but I think that that's going to radically change um, probably insurance as well as other regulatory mandates. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, a very mature, um, you know, HIPAA was enacted in 1996 for healthcare. And this is kind of the, the latest and greatest as far it, it's been called the ISO of cybersecurity. So I think that uh, have you heard anything around insurance companies looking at the CMMC as a, a framework to model? Um, I haven't heard too much. Uh, it's so insurance companies, if, if, if they're going to do whatever they need to do to make sure they obviously protect themselves and their sure. clients. Um, but yeah, that's something like I know that with California having their change that came through recently with the great like the one in Europe, the European one. You're going to see some changes over here. A lot of a lot of the carriers had to change because they had to fit that model. So yeah, if it's something that's going to be coming down from the pipeline that's going to affect or help their clients or their bottom line, they're going to probably they'll, they'll definitely follow suit and start working in that arena and try and get set up. I mean, yeah, I know it's uh, and, and and that's one thing with insurance is not it's your last line of defense. It's not your preemptive. You know, hey, we're going to help you. You know, before it happens, that's not what it's for. So it's when you get hit, when you get hacked and you have to send out notifications to all of your clients, that's what it's for. Defense cost, all these different things. That's when it, it comes into play. And that's what people need to understand that it's that's why they ask the questions up front. Do you have these security measures in place because it's less like you'll get hit? Or if you do have someone, is a, you know, if you do see signs, you can you can can act quickly enough to know. Um, so. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. And well said. I, I mean, I've been saying that for years. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, you know, you always want to have your systems protected. You want to be doing the, the checks of your policies, procedures, your risk assessment. You want to be doing all this stuff. But then some people, especially small businesses, they look at me or they talk to me and they're like, you're crazy. I'm not going to pay that much money to do X, Y, or Z. And it, like, look, I, I, I'm not the one that's responsible for all the pricing around this. I just know how to, I've got the map, I've got the compass and I've got the flashlight. I know how to get around this, <laughs> this jungle, right. right. And, and do it as efficiently as possible, but you have to be willing to listen. And if you're not willing to listen to the direction and to my advice and you know, you, your days are numbered. I mean, the, the hackers are, are smart and lazy. And I've said this for years, they're scanning your networks. They're looking for mm -hmm. weak points and holes, just like, a criminal will be profiling your neighborhood or your house. You know, if you're the dark house and you don't have an alarm system and you don't have camera systems or a dog or anything, and you're low hanging fruit, then you're mo more likely statistically to get broken into. Um, yeah. I'm a firm believer in what's called the onion concept or the layered approach. And the more stuff that you implement, if we're talking about a house in this dark corner, if we put some lights there and we add some camera systems and maybe get a dog and, you know, get an alarm system to, to, you know, sensor all the windows and doors and things like that. You're not just going to want to put a sensor on the front door. <laughs> You're right. a, a total ecosystem that covers you. And if, right. you, if you cut corners because of money, the hackers are going to see that, you know, on mm -hmm. your networks or physically. Um, mm -hmm. And the only way to score yourself is to really pay attention to this stuff and review this stuff on a regular basis at a minimum, an annual basis, so that you know where your gaps are. And right. I don't recommend that most people do that themselves. You want to have a professional come in and do that to score you. And that's what I love about the CMMC. And that's why I really hope that um, the insurance companies are going to adopt a similar model to that because you can't fake it anymore. You right. can't say that you're doing certain things. You have to show two forms of supporting evidence for each of the 110 plus control layers you know, that's yeah. a big deal. <laughs> so um, yeah, ultimately, I think it'll, it'll reduce your payouts from insurance companies significantly. Yes. You know? And, and speaking of that, I mean, right now, you as a, as a company, you could check yes to everything that the insurance company asks on the application. The insurance company is not going to check until there's a claim. And at that point, they're going to go back and say, well, you said you had security here, 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 here. And you had this, that, and the other. Where's your documentation? Where's the proof that this was up and running? Where's the proof that this happened or it would have caught this? Because otherwise, we may not pay this claim because you didn't. Ah, do that's interesting that you you bring that up. So if somebody lies on the application and says yes, yes, yes to this, but then it comes to that they get ransomware and they go back to you or to your providers and say, look, I need coverage for this. They'll mm -hmm. do. I'm sure the insurance company will do their own due diligence and investigation, and if they can yep. prove that 
there is no supporting evidence for the yeses on the application, then they may deny the claim. Is that accurate? That's correct. And something a little bit different, like uh, you have, you know, um, loss of income. So if your company shut down, we'll say this, your company shut down for 12 months and you have, you know, receipts, your accounts receivable, all this stuff is wiped out. It's no longer there. They'll send in a forensic team and they'll find all this stuff through all of your system and everything. And they say, okay, Mr. Company XYZ, right now, on average, you're getting 20,000 a month. So we're going to go ahead and pay you the 240,000 to make you whole for the next year because you use that for 12 months. So that's what I'm saying. They, they do their due diligence when it comes time to claim. If it's a big enough claim and it's something that's when it's specialized, yes, they're going to do they're going to do their due diligence through and, and pick through everything and say, oh, well, you have your application here. Yeah, it says yes on this, but you didn't you didn't have this in place. So we're going to deny the claim. Yes. Got it. OK. And now, is there any do you know of any? Um, obviously, that's fraud <laughs> and it's yes. dishonest. Um, is there any criminal actions in addition to you know the insurance not paying out the claim? Um, if it's if it's considered insurance fraud, sure. If you were trying to de, if you were trying to push push a fast one on the insurance companies, yes, they could take legal action. I don't know if they would because if you lost a lot, they're going to say, well, that's you know, it's it's hard enough because they lost everything. But you need to make sure you make aware whenever the person's filling out. That's one thing I make when they're filling out the application. I usually ask them the questions or I have them complete the questions because I want to make sure that they see what the question is and they know it. And if they say yes to it and they sign up on that application, they're saying that everything on this, this legal document is, is precise and true. And yes, there could be, I haven't really seen any situation of that, but if the insurance company wanted to go after it, yes, they could make an example of someone and they could take them to court, you know, have well, that's, that's all really good information though, because I've had folks actually tell me that, no, no, I'm not going to do all that stuff. I get, I just buy insurance to cover me for that. So it sounds like the days are numbered or that's pretty much over nowadays where you can't yes. lie to the insurance company and, and try to make it ignorance or an excuse of not doing the things that you should be doing. Right. And and more and more companies are getting into the mix, meaning buying cyber insurance, who before would look at it and say, why do I need that? I've got a, you know, my POS systems with, um, you know, such as like Equifax or it's with uh, CS, uh, NCR, all my stuff's with them. They'll take care of it. Well, it's still you're the point of contact. You're the one that's here. I mean, look at, you know, when I think it was uh, Home Depot got hit and their whole situation, you know, and Target's another example. You know, the point of service was with Target. They didn't look at the point of service company as being the fault. Everybody in the everybody in the, in, the, in, in America and the, probably the world looked at it was Target. Yeah, they're the ones that got the black eye, not the, the POS system. And Home Depot's hack was a guy that was an HVAC guy who came in and went ahead and plugged into their system. Didn't have their the the um, correct security uh, upload that, that, that Home Depot employees and all the computers did. And that's you know the the, the tool in both of those examples, the Home Depot, the Target. The Sony, the Michaels, they're all from a sub one hundred dollar black market keylogger. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that's and that's what everybody you know the hackers and all these guys they're not like Hollywood where they're going after the government like we're going to break take down the government we're going to do we're going to they're going after anyone they want the lead, path of least resistance if they can get into someone small and that small can get into someone big they just chain reaction keep well, going. Well, that's why so ransomware get... is so big and you know ransomware yeah. and then now the the cryptocurrency mining malware now that mines yeah. bitcoin and other things when bitcoin was more easy to mine but the altcoins whatever the, the fact of the matter is this stuff this malware it's hard to detect you know antivirus the latest statistic is you know, it's 95% not effective. <laughs> so yeah. only 5% effective. Um, you know, it's one layer. You can't rely on your firewall and your antivirus to protect you anymore. There's the human element as well. And you can't rely on your vendors to protect you either. I have a lot of people that tell me, oh, I'll just go to AWS GovCloud or I'll do HIPAA compliance with AWS or Amazon or Google and they'll sign a BAA with me, you know, but you have to read the fine print. You have your own responsibilities and you're Correct. the one, they're giving you the infrastructure, but it's up to you or a professional to configure that infrastructure and make it secure. And the security is all on you and all their le the, the legal terms and their terms of use and service, they all list that out and nobody reads it, but, but I'm highlighting that it's a fact that they list that stuff out. So yeah, they give you great systems to use that you can build upon as a foundation, but you are and or a professional 
ideally a professional, should be configuring this stuff for you and monitoring it on a continuous basis. This is not a one and done stuff anymore. You can't just do it right. one time. Right. And, you know, it's another thing that, uh, you know, Justin Daniels from um, Donaldson Baker with, with yeah. the ProVisor, he, uh, he invited me to a, it was basically a, so it was a simulated um, hack uh, and he brought in the secret service and he was saying that if you have a situation where you do a wire transfer, you have about three to four days in which to get in touch with the bank to stop it. If it goes after that and goes overseas, it's gone forever. And he was saying that people to contact immediately is a secret service because they have a department, a division in the department that actually handles this wire transfer fraud, all this cybersecurity stuff, which people don't know. He said, you get in touch, don't call your local police because they're not going to do anything. They're not going to know what's going to happen. But if you call the Secret Service, they can immediately contact that bank and get to the right person immediately and put a hold on that money. And he said, you know, it's it's usually above 25000 Under that, they don't really mess with it. But um, a lot of times people will get – it's amazing what people get tri tricked on. It's like, you know, hey, the person will call up. I need 15 Best Buy cards or this, that, that and oh, the other. Yeah, and money, yeah money packs or yeah. cards or, you know, impersonations, spoofed emails, business email compromise. Well, he was Dan, uh, Justin was talking about AI now. He's had a situation oh, yeah. one of his clients. They got a call. The C, the CFO was out of town. He was on vacation, and this person sounded exactly like him. Called him to the secretary, and his secretary said, "Hey, listen, I need this money wired ASAP. I've got I'm, while I'm on vacation, I got this account that we're working on. It's not going to go through unless I get this money. It was like seventy five thousand dollars, whatever it is." And we needed ASAP. Well, they were getting in the, they were, the whole company was in the process of getting all this taken care of. All of a sudden, they got a call again. It's the same exact script, same exact everything. And that's what tipped them off that this doesn't seem right. It turns out it was AI that was doing the whole thing. And it's just. Yeah, they're actually re recording people's voices and putting it mm -hmm. into the AI system to build out that voice pattern and change and manipulate the pattern, just like you talked about. That's why you ever get those scam calls that want you to say all yes. The time. You know, so they record your voice and they make patterns out of the, using AI software. That's absolutely true. Yeah, I hear them all the time. I get them a call I'm like, "Hey, we've got a great deal for you," and I was like, "What? What's the deal? Let's talk about it." And like, and it kind of trips it up a little bit. I'll right. Something <laughs> different. Yeah. And I knew immediately. I'm like, "Oh, this is fake," and I just hang up on it or I'll block the call. But yep. yeah, I mean, it's the the hackers and the criminals are getting smarter, and they're they're working day and night to do this. And it's a lot of a, a lot of areas, a lot of Large companies, a lot of, you know, governments need to, they just think, oh, we'll take care of it. It'll be easy. But it's, it's, it's just, you know, once there's not, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when you get hacked. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it, and it's training, you know, it boils down to training, secu ongoing security awareness training. I'm actually going to be building out a brand new security awareness training from my company. Um, okay. We have a lot of companies that we work with on the training side of things, but we're going to actually create our own around that because we have our own methodology around it. But yeah, I mean, just yesterday I got an email from a, a CPA firm that's in my contacts. So I, right. I, it's kind of trusted, right? It's in my circle because I know who right. it is. And, but I knew immediately it wasn't the person, it, it was a spoofed email. And I pick up, I picked up the phone and I call, I took screenshots of it to create the evidence trail. And I picked up the phone and I called her and left a message I still didn't get a call back. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's people that, you know, they don't take this stuff seriously enough to understand, look, I'm tipping you off to a huge problem that you're probably not aware of because you, your organization isn't at the maturity level to have detection and monitoring systems to, to look at this stuff. But look at how embarrassing, you know, if I'm not the only one that got that email. I'll put money on it. You know, a lot of her contacts or others in that company got those emails and there's going to be people that are clicking on those links that could have ransomware or some other keylogger malware on there. Yeah. And if you're a CPA, that's the one thing. If you get hit, it's like you got to do everything you can to cover that up because you could lose clients. Because now all of a sudden when they send the personal information, all the documentation for taxes to be signed off for the IRS, yep. it's like, how do I know you're going to be secure and safe? And it's just, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's great. It's great. I have a, a friend of mine who does, Kind of similar to what you do. He's a their consulting firm, and they go and have this database, this uh, algorithm program that can go into a company. Can it can look at everything, their whole entire security system, and tell them where their weak spots are. Mm -hmm. and, and they went into one 
few year, number of years ago, a major company on Peachtree Street here in Atlanta and told them this, you've got to look at this area. Areas. They just blew it off. No big deal. And four months later, they got hit huge. And he's like, we, we told you. Oh, yeah. We've done drills like that before. We I've done some marketing experiments around what's called red team, blue team. And yeah. we look at the outside perimeter of, of people's websites and networks and be like, look, you've got these gaping holes. You know, you should really fix this and patch it up. Nine out of 10 would ignore us and just, yeah. oh, yeah, we've got that covered. Oh, Bobby in the corner, he's got he's doing a good job with that. You know? Yeah. He's got like a guy on a Commodore 64 sitting there working out this stuff. And it's just <laughs> like, yeah, it's like this doesn't work. You got to understand you got to you've got to be up to speed because you think you're small, but you may work with larger companies. And that's why the larger companies require their subs, all these people that come in to have that limit, because if I have a $5 million limit and I hire you to come in and do some services and you have a $1 million limit, that means if we're, if you're hit, if I'm hit and you're hit and it's your fault, I only have a million dollars of coverage for you. I have to use 4 million of mine right. just to make it whole if I get hit for that. So it's like now I'm in, now I'm basically on the hook for this stuff. So I've taken you on as an employee almost because now I have to cover your, your insurance. Yeah. So it's, you know, people complain all the time. It's like, you know, if you want to work with the big, big companies, you're going to have to increase or work with them, talk to them and say, hey, can I at least have a couple of years until my company's larger? Then we can look into getting these increases that you're asking for. But once you get those increases, it's like a license to hunt. You go after the bigger fish then. You know, you start going after the companies, the AT&Ts, the, the sure. Cokes, all the different ones. So, and we've, we've, we've gone over that with a number of clients of ours. Of, of once you get this, you now can basically go to about anybody. So it's. So it's almost like a competitive edge. I mean, it's, it's almost like yes. a, a tool in your box, you know, that you can use that helps put you above, you know, the pack as far as competition goes. Yes. Um, I, I know that I've been hired several times. My company has been hired to do what's called vendor security questionnaires or VSQs, mm -hmm. just like the example that you gave, you know, the bigger guy wants to do business with the smaller guy the smaller guy gets this huge spreadsheet and it's like, whoa, I don't know how to answer all this stuff. And it could be like yeah. 300. I've seen questions all the way over 600 questions on all this stuff. And the, the, the company's like, whoa, I don't know how to answer this. So then they got start looking, they find me and my company oftentimes. And, and that's one of our specialties. We know how to fill all that out, but it's an educational experience for the client because oftentimes the, the client doesn't have half of the stuff they're supposed to have. Right. Know? So right. and a lot of times when they get these um, agreements, you know, we'll, they'll send it to us immediately and say, hey, they're asking for this insurance, these limits. Do I have it? And we'll look through and see, OK, you've got they're asking for two million. You've got a one million underlying and a, and a one million umbrella. So, yeah, you're good there. Um, you have a five hundred thousand work comp. They're asking for for a million. Um, we'll have to increase that uh, or your umbrella can sometimes sit over the work comp. And the reason why I bring up those lines is because those are the ones, those are the ones that are going to be the biggest ticket items. Um, your cyber is going to be in there, obviously, in different ones, but your, your underlying general liability work comp, those are the ones that are going to stand out immediately. You send them the certificate, the COI, those are going to be the top ones, automobile, work comp, umbrella, general liability. That's it. The other stuff, we can put it in a, in a separate place down below, but there's not a, there's not a field to fill it in the way it is for those. Um, and that's where a lot of times they want a 10 million underlying GL, 10 million umbrella. Uh, just a few companies will do that. But, you know, that's that's one thing. Like I said, if you're a startup company and you're going to you're going to hunt with those guys, it's like, yeah, you need a bigger gun. <laughs> you're, <laughs> yeah. you're, I'm sorry, man, you're not going to make this. <laughs> now, are there any questions that automatically fail? Meaning like in the CMMC world, if you don't have what's called a system security plan, you auto fail for the, the NIST um, 800-171 interim rule requirement that was released by the DOD. So if you don't, basically the DOD um, a few weeks ago now, November 30th was the deadline, actually last week. Um, and basically they said, look, to federal defense contractors, um, you're supposed to be compliant with NIST 800-171 framework per DFAR 7012. And this has been in place for over five years now. We want to see your supporting evidence of your system security plan or your SSP, your self-assessment score, and your POAMs, your plan of action and milestones to get you to the perfect score of 110. We need you to upload all this by November 30th. 
So there's this huge scramble, you know, everybody's like, oh my God, I don't have this, you know, and they're freaking out and they need help from companies like us, which is where we're the certified experts in this space. And we noticed that, um, that's why I was asking you earlier, it was interesting to hear about how some folks federal in the federal defense contractor space, they're taking contract awards that are worth millions of dollars and they're self, they're saying, yeah, 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 I'm checking the box, I'm, I'm good with NIST 800-171 but they're not. <laughs> so now that they came out with this law, I think it was released October 1st was the notice, the interim rule. And I think it's going to be a shakeout of, look, they know that's why the whole CMMC came out. They, the DOD knows that most are not compliant. Right. I think what they wanted to do with that DOD interim rule is figure out who, who is compliant, who can, right. who of you all that over 300,000 of you, who, who can show your cards and show us supporting evidence. And right. then, I think it could lead to what's called the False Claims Act fraud, which is nasty. That's you have to pay back three times the contract award plus fifteen thousand plus per infraction, so it skyrockets. It's it's nasty. Yeah, you're dealing with the government in that situation, and that's the one that whenever you have a data breach, they're the ones that comes out after you and says, okay, you have to pay, you know, X number of per per account that you have per item per person within that company. If you work with a thousand people. And you have to you get fined for a thousand of them. You're talking 20, 30. I mean, it could be up way up there. So when it comes to the government, yes, it could be but the insurance company is just going to look at it and just deny the claim. Then you're on your own or they could go after you for, you know, that would be the more of the insurance commissioner could do that for credit right. for insurance fraud. They, they could come after you separately, but they could file with the insurance commissioner. And I'm pretty sure North Carolina is the same way. But in Georgia, they can come to your office they can come to your house and rest you right on the spot. You know, I've seen that situation where a person was doing something in the life insurance field. He was doing union life insurance policies and wasn't credentialed and able to do it. Yeah, you know, our John Oxendine years ago went to his office and arrested him on the spot and put him in jail. So, wow. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the things when you're talking to the government, that's one place I don't wouldn't fool around with. It's just because <laughs> if, if they want to find out, they're going to find out. An yeah, insurance you know, company, it's they, crazy. All of, you know, we special, we've been in business almost 19 years now. And yeah. one of our first regulatory specialties was HIPAA compliance for medical practices. Yes. And I would, I've written books on HIPAA and I'd educate dentists and doctors and, you know, um, work with hospitals and, and various, you know, general and specialist medical practices. And almost nine out of 10 of them had no clue about all the stuff that I was talking about. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, we're HIPAA compliant. Here's our binder. They'd show me this binder and it had like a couple sentences of paragraphs and that, that was their they're supporting evidence of all the policies they were supposed to have. And it's yes. just a complete nightmare and a mess. So I would help educate them on why they need to do this stuff. And hey, look, the acting sheriff is the Office of Civil Rights. And if you get busted with this, it's nasty. You're going out of business because it, it skyrockets really quick. And they're, yeah. they, you know, they glaze over and they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of times, like I said, when the people are filling out the insurance application, you know, Yes, I mean, if they have a claim, that's when the insurance company can go back and do their due diligence, go do a forensic, take a look and go deep, a deeper dive. And they may turn up some stuff, you know, but if the what if the what if the what if the company decides to put all this safe stuff in place while that's going on? And oh, wait, we said yes to yes, we've got a manual that shows all of our different structures of what we do as far as security and everything. We don't have that. Let's get it quick. Get it quick. So, I mean, <laughs> stuff like that. I mean, they could throw things but some things. I'm, I'm pretty confident there's certain things. I mean, I'm. I'm pretty not very savvy as savvy as I mean, I'm insurance. I'm incredible. But, you know, I'm sure there's stuff that you could teach me on the IT world. It's like, wow, that's pretty amazing. You know, but I'm pretty confident there's certain things that they can't get in place in time if they have to do something where it's like, OK, they're asking for deep, deep dives. And, and I think another company's like, well, we don't really have that. Well, you said yes or no on this this, this application that you did or you don't. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's it could be it could be scary working with insurance and with the, with the government. You know, most of the government, I'd be more afraid of them, I think, than, than anything. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you said the timeline, too. And that was one of the things that was released in the um, the CMMC certification track that we did. Um, they said, look, you know, you, there's no on-off switch to this stuff. You need right. to show a trail, a long trail of supporting evidence that you're doing the security risk assessments, the penetration testing, the audits, the 
the updates of your policies, procedures, your logs, your, all your supporting evidence, your two forms of supporting evidence for each of the 110 plus controls. You need to show a culture of all of that in your organization. And if you don't have that deep depth of, of evidence and that bulk, then, then you're, you're, you're done. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, what's, if, you, if it's 110, what, is there a special number you have to be at or is it like, well, it depends on, on how much, you know, so if you, they call it CUI or controlled unclassified information. So if you're okay. dealing with the, um, sensitive information that's around a federal contract, uh, maybe you're an engineering company and you do blueprints for the department of defense, that's considered right. controlled unclassified information or CUI you have an obligation to protect that. And the right. framework to protect that is called NIST 800-171. And the new, new twist on that is now the CMMC. In this example, it'd be level three or higher because you're dealing with CUI. Level right. five is the maximum security. It'll take years to get there. And level one is the most basic. And if you're dealing with CUI, you're automatically a three or higher. So okay. there's 110 controls and there's now an additional 20 that were added with CMMC level three. And what they're saying is you need to have supporting evidence of all of these things to form. Yeah. And then you have to have a lead assessor come onto your premise from what's called a C3 PAO. They, he or she has to look over either you or your IT team's shoulders and go through all, with a fine tooth comb, all the supporting evidence and it's a pass fail, there's no partial credit. So if you fail and you don't have your SSP or you lied, you're done, you don't get it. And if you don't get it, you don't get to bid on contracts anymore. You're done, you're on the bench. <laughs> you know? Man, so that's, so that's the kind of a deal that it's it's basically, it's, uh, it's pretty, that's pretty strict. I mean, that's just cut and dry. Oh, yes. I think that people don't even realize how strict it is. I think that they're going to be really a big eye-opening experience for, I mean, we're working with a, a, a bunch of smart folks already that are ahead of the, you know, behind the eight ball on it. Yeah. And they're seeing, look, this is a big deal. But the people that are sitting on the sidelines right now that are that did not upload and, and comply with the DOD interim rule, because maybe they didn't think that it applied to them, but... Um, Katie Arrington, the chief CISO uh, from the DOD and the spokeswoman about the CMMC, she said it's 300,000 plus federal contractors. And she even said that if DFAR 7012 is not in your contract, but you have a contract from the federal government, from the Department of Defense, assume that it is in there. Because they have a clause in there that if they didn't put it in there, they could assume yeah. that, it, that you, you still need to apply it. So she's saying you need to do it anyway. And it's just amazing how many people I think have not even completed that step, but they're going to get the wake up call in a few months where they're, they're not going to be able to bid on, they're going to be off the, the system. They're not going to be able to bid on new contracts. Yeah. That's like one of the old saying they used to hear fake it till you make it. And you can't fake that. No, you, <laughs> that's what I mean. I, 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 wow. mean, I mean, look, I think it's going to be brutal. I think it's going to be hard on some folks. But here's the thing. I mean, you got uh, the, the federal contractors are supposed to be doing this for over five years anyway. I feel like it's a good thing for our country. I mean, yeah. we're getting hacks left and right from yes. adversaries that, you know, Chinese governments have planes that look yeah. just like ours now. You know, I mean, yeah. there's all sorts. I mean, where we have to do these things that are hard in the short term to get ahead. And, and put stop the bleeding, <laughs> you know, yeah. because our intellectual property and our secret sauce, that's what makes our country great. And if we can't, we can't control that and make sure our adversaries don't steal that from us, what edges do we have left? Yeah. I mean, like whenever they, um, the assassination of Osama bin Laden, when that helicopter that was secret crashed, they blew it up, took everything they could off it and blew it up. So Chinese and everything couldn't get a hold of it and come yeah. out and try and recreate it because They've already recreated one of our drones, and it's just, yeah, it's just that's scary. Well, it's air I mean, fighters too. It's not just drones. Yeah, I mean, it's big yeah, stuff yeah. that they've stolen. I've seen, yeah, and that's what I'm saying. I mean, if it protects, and you have people that are, are in the front line of, of creating this stuff, doing the software and all that, if there's something that, that the government's now finally stepping up to saying, you know what, we can't have this anymore. We got to cut, stop the bleeding of all this hacking because, you know, they've been hacked, and they've been hit. You know, it's. That state and, government. You know, we're, we're in the times now where it's so much easier for an adversary or a hacker to sit behind their computer and push a button to yeah. hurt you yeah. than it is to send somebody over or use military type force with a weapon. You know, yeah. the weapon now is digital. Right. 
you know? Right. So, I mean, and, and some of these are state run organizations. They're, you know, funded by the state to do this and sit in a room all day and do all this kind of stuff. So, you know, if someone could, if someone could have a, a software that could go in and like I said, you know, because the stealth bomber is a prime example, that thing will not fly without the computer system working it. It's just, it's not aerodynamic. It's, it's logistically impossible. Right. Yeah. But since they have that software in there and the computer systems, that's what allows it to fly. So if you could get into that and hack it and cut them off, drop them out of the sky. Sorry, guys. I mean, that's you're right. They were, if we were coming to attack someone, they could reprogram it, get in and hack. And next thing you know, it's like, well, dang, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, I mean, we're in crazy times. Uh, have really, you noticed um, one thing that I thought of when, when you were talking earlier? Have you noticed a... Um, a difference in your coverage and your options with people working from home due to COVID, you know, with businesses no longer in the quote unquote brick and mortar office anymore. There has been a little bit with that because they're starting to expand out on that. Um, I have received on some of my policies, some cyber, some others that they're, they're saying they're not going to cover any COVID related stuff, but you know, now all of a sudden you have to extend your protection because like, Example, even in our office, you know, everybody's taking their computers home. Right. Now they're not hooked up to the network that we have secured our office. They're hooked up to their personal. Right. It may not be set up the way it needs to be. So they've had to go in and restructure our, our security systems. But yeah, you'll probably see something. You might. It, I haven't really seen anything much from the carriers um, yet, but that's not to say they're not working on stuff. I mean, right. Just some of the renewals I haven't been coming in. There has been some tweaks as far as what's covered, what what, what the definition of, of COVID and all this stuff. But yeah, I'm, I'm foreseeing some, some, some changes because more and more, and you're probably going to have, this might be a new, new norm as people working from home more. I think that's true. I think a, a lot of people, they've, you know, been doing this for what, seven, eight months now. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, businesses have been forced to adapt and change or die. Um, and they've adopted technologies like this with Zoom or WebEx or other online, you know, collaboration tools. And I think that this might be um, the new culture and the new way for a lot of businesses to stay this way, save the money on the rent, right? Yeah. But still not an excuse for, like you said, I mean, you know, all these home networks are are not configured properly. And, and once again, they need to be tested. They need to be there needs to be a security risk assessment done at that home level, <laughs> whether right. it's by your corporate office or if you're a small business, then you need to hire a professional to go check that stuff. Because guess what? If there's a default password on that router or somebody sits in the driveway and breaks in, they can get to your computer information. And if you're working for a company that's dealing with sensitive information, whether it be medical PHI or PII or insurance or with the government, CUI, any anything sensitive, right? It, yeah, it's easy and ripe for hackers to break into with a password and a username of admin admin. <laughs> so you know, if you, <laughs> have, if you haven't gone and you and checked your security controls, and again, it's it's a layered model. So there's different things that you have to do with the physical and the software and the the training of the human element in, right. in a home environment. If you're not doing those things, then you've got risks. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I brought that up to somebody about the the, the fact that it's a little side note, but when you talk about how a lot of these companies don't have to pay rent for these large buildings anymore, so yeah. what it may do, they may skim it down to maybe just a handful of executives and some people, you know, a few other people, and just have meetings. They can come to the building for meetings, but they don't need all that space anymore. So you know, it's it, we'll see. It's only time will tell. I mean, it could be we could be back to normal after everything's settled down. You know, I don't know. Yep. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, <wish I> did. <laughs> I guess we'll see. I, I think that there'll be a reduction in commercial application. I think obviously certain business models, you know, labs or, or places that have specialized machinery or, you know, obviously they need a place, but um, maybe they're going to have salespeople work from home, or maybe there's going to be certain divisions of their company that stays working from home, or maybe smaller companies that are able to work from home are going to stay that way. So I think it's going to be interesting moving forward for sure. But I agree. Um, yeah, this has been fantastic. Um, thank you for for joining. And oh, thank you. This, this has been good. I appreciate it. I've had a, it was good. It was really good speaking with you today. Yeah, my pleasure. So, tell folks once again how do they reach you? You know, do they you have your website, your phone number, etc. We um, they can my phone number. They can call me. I got it right here. I, I don't remember my I don't mer memorize my own business number because I don't ever call it. <laughs> they can call me at seven seven zero. Let me get the extension. Hang on one second. Sorry. Yeah. 
I thought, I thought about this right when we started talking. I was like, <laughs> I probably should get this. And I got my car, but I, my glasses aren't on. So 770-466-9475, extension 1103. Uh, my email address is matt.holcomb, H-O-L-C-O-M-B, at Biltmore, B-I-L-T-M-O-R-E-I-N-S.com. And like I said, we're, we're, we're always looking to help our clients and anybody else that might need it, you know, so with our experience and our knowledge, I think we can, can really help them out and just kind of pick through their, 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 like you said, these get these contracts that come in, we can pick through that and say, okay, you're not, you're not compliant here or here. And you've already signed this contract. So you better get compliant pretty quick because if they have a claim, they're coming back at you and they could sue you for breach of contract. So that's another thing to think of. Awesome. Well, great information. Now, what States are you licensed in to help folks? I believe we're licensed in basically just about every state in the union. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, we're 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 part of Watkins. We're a large, large entity, so we have okay. um, different offices all over the southeast, so we can help just basically about any state. Awesome. Well, thank yeah. you, Matt. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, have Craig, a great I appreciate day. It. Yeah, you too. Thank you. All right, take care. You too. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to yet another episode of Cybersecurity and Compliance with Craig Petronella. Listen to all of our podcasts on Apple, Google, and Spotify. Visit us online at petronellatech.com to book a meeting with Craig about your business. Thanks for listening to the Cybersecurity and Compliance Podcast with Craig Petronella. For other episodes and more information, visit petronellatech.com. Also visit our other websites, compliancearmor.com and blockchainsecurity.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for listening and stay secure.